Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're now at the point where we'll go to the press and look at the headlines uh, that made it to the front pages of our national dailies or some of our national dailies. And we're being uh, joined uh, this morning by Professor Sani Fage. Good morning and welcome to the program, Professor. Uh, good morning and thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be looking at... Uh, Headlines on the Guardian, Daily Trust, Punch, and Vanguard newspaper. And we're beginning with the Guardian newspaper this morning. The, um, the leading story here is federal government's non-retention policy. Over 5,032 first-class graduates languish amid vacancies in universities. Okay, you are in the academia and you're seeing this. Some time ago, when you have a first class, there's a possibility that you'll be retained in your university or you, there will be a ready job for you. Now, it is no longer that way. And they're saying 5,000, over 5,032 first class graduates are languishing amidst vacancies in universities. First of all, are there vacancies in universities and is this a true situation of what is happening right now? Yeah, it is a, a true situation. Like you said, all my life I have been in the academia and uh, I happen to be in the system through that uh, policy where they retain uh, good candidates. Uh, at least uh, then it was very difficult for someone to get past class, but uh, no matter what, the good ones are retained. And that is how we are able to grow through the system from graduate assistant up to where I am now. But the fact is that uh, in our universities now, we have very, very serious problem of uh, staffing. Actually, uh, you see somebody um, is involved in so many things. Like now, we, we don't have uh, a break whether in the holidays or whatever is either you are in the class or you are making exam or you are making essays and uh, the fact is that there are lower classes that uh, you have more than 1000 uh, student per class and somebody has to take that along with uh, uh, you know other classes in short you have to take no less than five to six classes per uh, session so all this shows that uh, we have serious problem of uh, uh, staffing. So I think um, this policy, which used to uh, serve us well, uh, should have been revisited. Because after all, we have so many reasons. Many people are retiring. Uh, many people are dead. Uh, many people are leaving the system. And you still block uh, uh, the situation. You see, it is so bad that uh, in many institutions, like the one I am in now, that uh, one way for the system to uh, try to manage to survive is to go to the administrative sector and get non-academic staff and combat them to come and teach. And these are people who don't have background in the area. And these are people uh, who uh, also, if we keep them, it's just for a short time, they will retire too. So I think the, this policy should be revisited. Wow, it, this, is, this is really an eye-opener and it, it sounds scary. You, you just conscript, as it were, people who are not qualified to do that, to come and do the job. But do, do you think it's a matter of funds, like uh, budgetary allocations that are not enough for universities to, to employ these people? I, hear, I see here in this report that before you can uh, employ even one, one lecturer, you have to go through about seven MDAs, namely the National Universities Commission, uh, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, Federal Character Commission, Office of the Head of Service, and IPPIS Office. All these ones just to uh, employ one lecturer. That's, that's serious. I don't know. Shouldn't universities have yeah, some, yeah, some level of autonomy that they can it's employ these people? Yeah. Yes. You see, it's a very serious thing, really. Uh, the fact is, yes, there is short of fun, but... Uh, the main problem is what we have been kicking, which led us to uh, that eight months uh, strike. You know, there is an agreement 
Oh, there was an agreement between the, the system and the government that uh, empowers uh, for general policy making to uh, the university governing council. In other words, they are the employers. So that is why each university will employ according to its own need. But now you centralize it in such a way that uh, you, you, you don't have to, you cannot recruit even one person. Even if you a laborer, you have to go through all these channels. And by the time you now said you are going to employ, what will happen before you get the approval, each of the approving agency will give you some candidates. So you may have like uh, a, a vacancy for about five people, and at the end of it, they will inject more than 30 uh, from their own, who are not even qualified. They will be forced into the system. I'm telling you, uh, through this process, that is why you know, universities find a way to say, okay, let's conscript the administrators who are already employed, you move them, and they are not qualified to work. And the other thing is that by the time you go through this process, you get so many things. I knew of so many cases. Uh, you know, some people were sent from Abuja to come and teach, and some of them even in the medical profession, and they cannot do anything. The, the, when, when the university authority give them uh, assignment, they are not fit to do it. These are people who have been forced down on the throat of the universities. And uh, so the only thing that you do is you cannot reject them because they are sent from above. And then you give them, like I said, some are even in medical profession and uh, they contribute to, you know, the, the death rate that we are having in our teaching hospital because all these are part of the things you over bureaucratize the system you uh, now inject corruption into it and this is what you are seeing the side effect of it uh, here I, I don't know is it over democratize the system or over politicize the system because i say over bureaucratize okay it, bureaucratize the system uh, okay. bureaucratization not for uh, democratization oh, okay i didn't system, get that well the fight was on democratizing uh, democratizing the system by now uh, over centralize it oh that's that's really serious but just to play the devil's advocate if a university is given the opportunity or the right uh, to employ who pays the people that they employ because uh, maybe the federal government is doing this uh, because of uh, the kind of funds that they have uh, injected into universities so I cannot allow you to just employ according to what you feel is your needs and then the debt burden the, the salary burden and everything will be resting on me so what are the universities also doing to make sure that if they employ these people they can sustain these people they can they can keep these people and pay them for instance uh, is the, gener the university generating any funds at all that can help in doing that you see, the, the system is in such a way that the governing council is representing the, the, the government. It is the government that appoints the governing council who are to run the university on behalf of the government. And uh, the president is the visitor of the university. So everybody is working in the name of the government. Okay? So even if you now give them, they have budget. You, you, it's not just that the university will sit down and employ anybody. They have a budget which they submit, which is approved. They work within the approved budget by the government. This is just part of the corruption why you have it. But all over the world, that is how you run universities. You allow the governing council to run the uh, system. And after all, remember when we had the eight-month crisis, one of the things that we are begging the government to now set a panel to come and, uh, you know, uh, audit the account of the university. And the government refused to do it. Uh, okay. So it is uh, not that way. It's not just that the governing council is appointed by the university. No, it is by the government. You only have representation of uh, the university community in the governing council. And the Senate all over the world is the one that is in charge with uh, academic uh, matters. 
like employment of staff, like other things, is in the Senate uh, thing, where you have seasoned academics and they propose and send it through the governing council, and the governing council will deliberate, take decision, and now allow like it. It's just like any system, you have a process. Only that, uh, I don't know why the government is so adamant in trying to kill the university system by uh, putting it uh, such a huge uh, bureaucracy. But it has been the system that has been working for us until, you know, when the politician decided to interrupt and uh, change uh, so many things. And now, like they say, if you want to kill a dog, give it a bad name. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they give it uh, the system as if uh, the government doesn't uh, know what is happening. The government knows. Even how many people you admit, you have to take it for the, you know, uh, to the appropriate body to now agree as to number. You are assigned a certain number of uh, by a point and um, um, position to apply to admit candidate. When you do, you take the list through jumps, through this and so for approval. So there is overall, you know, control and uh, the overseeing of the process. The only thing is that you allow the system to work democratically and then you have the government to do the necessary approval. Mm. Okay, let's move to other matters. There are so many headlines that are juicy this morning. Um, EFCC withdraws appeal against order restraining Yahya Bello's arrest. Uh, there's been drama over, around the former Kogi state governor. Now we hear this, a lot of people are confused what is really happening. Even a few hours after uh, the EFCC chairman vowed that this prosecution must go on, I'm going to deal with the people who obstructed justice and so many other things. And then we see this, we don't even understand what is happening. Even though they have said that um, uh, this uh, appeal have been overtaken by some other events, but we still don't understand what is happening. Does this send a good picture of what is going on in this fight against corruption or not? You see, you see what is happening with uh, the Koji uh, saga is the usual pattern of Nigerian system. Uh, you know, the, the law enforcement agencies or the agencies that are in charge are empowered to do this, but eventually through corruption again, uh, you know, corruption is fighting, as you fight it, it will be fighting back. Uh, eventually, if care is not taken, uh, this one will fizzle out because you go to court, there will be a field, and now they, they will start talking of his fundamental human right, which is part of what is democratic. But to us is that we now find a certain lacuna, a certain loophole within the laws, and now he will be free. With all these things, uh, remember what happened to other uh, EFCC people, okay? Like uh, the first one, the immediate first one, uh, Bawa. Bawa ended up, you know, in uh, detention while the person who embezzled come out and even be a minister who is in charge. So the politician sees themselves as a different class, as a different set of Nigerians, and that there is Nigeria for the politician and there is the Nigeria for the ordinary people. So as far as they are concerned, politicians are above the law. What will happen is all these things will now end up, like I said, it will fizzle out because uh, he will be using uh, the legal system, he will be using political powers and so on, all to get through. And eventually, uh, like all other uh, you know, corruption cases, this will just go down the drain. It will be a history that uh, so-so has been accused of embezzling this amount of money and nothing will be done. Okay, let's move to Daily Trust. We move from Guardian to Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, corruption, undue influence, undermine our justice system. That's according to CJN. And Tinubu, NBA, demand judiciary reforms. Uh, curb ex parte order abuse, Aquabio tells NGC, NJC. Rather. Politicians, not judges, to blame. 
Yadudu. Oh, that's, that's happening. Uh, there was a conference that was held and now everybody was talking about how j the judiciary needs to be reformed. Akwabio said that uh, the use of ex parte order has become an indiscriminate thing. Every, people are just using it anyhow and this should stop. Uh, the president is calling for a reform and every other person and blames are being traded. What do you think about what is happening in the um, judicial system? What kind of reforms do you think can uh, be put in place to make sure that it, our judiciary is better? You see, one way is to restore the independence of the judiciary. Uh, on paper, we have uh, judiciary, legislature, and executive are uh, all independent, autonomous uh, arms of the government. But uh, somehow, our uh, judiciary is uh, weak uh, as a result of uh, corruption, but most importantly, as a result of uh, uh, excessive intervention, political intervention. Uh, so that is why even the good ju uh, ju judges are uh, compromised either through corruption or through reasons. Uh, I don't want to mention them, but look at uh, what the, the Senate President is saying about uh, the abuse of expertise order. Okay, you see, this is what we have. We always blame the system. Remember uh, when he was a governor, when he was a minister, was he was oh, there were uh, uh, charges of corruption against him, and he has been he used the same expertise order to mm. get through. Up to now, the cases on him have not been settled, and yes, despite all these cases, he's now number three in Nigeria. So you see, this is what uh, I was saying that uh, the politicians uh, create a different Nigeria. That the Nigeria has belonged to them. That is for the politicians. And then uh, we have Nigeria for the ordinary person. Uh, they do things with impunity. So that is why uh, if you, no matter the reform, unless you address this very problem, uh, it will go, uh, you know, uh, it becomes useless. So I think uh, it's good that we reform the system. It's good that we restore the autonomy of the system. It's good that uh, we now emphasize uh, credibility in the system. But actually, the real thing is we have to, uh, you know, uh, 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 shun it, I mean, protect it from undue political influence. Let it be as autonomous as it should be in Nigeria and in any other political uh, climate. So unless we do that, uh, I think we'll be given a bubble. Hmm. It, all they are saying uh, to me is a lip side, lip service. What really, who really hit the nail on the head is uh, Professor Adud, when he said politicians are to be blamed because they are the one who use corruption to corrupt the system. They are the one who use and do influence to put uh, whoever is there, they are the one who manipulate uh, things, they are the one who create uh, uh, the system in such a way that uh, they are above the law. Okay, let me take a small headline here before I miss it. It's very tiny on the bottom left corner of uh, Daily Trust. Uh, Versity workers demand 350,000 Naira minimum wage. Tell us about this. Uh, do you have any idea what's going on? 350,000 Naira minimum wage demanded by workers of universities. Yeah, you see, you see, it's not uh, in the in the system. We have at least three different uh, uh, unions. This is by NAT, uh, the technologists. Now, the, their point is that uh, one, they promise they will not go below or above that uh, 300. And the argument is that uh, what you do now in Nigeria is not a question of minimum wage, but a living wage. That if you take impilation, uh, you know, you know, uh, the minimum that a person needs to survive in Nigeria is 350,000 naira per month which I think is uh, uh, far less than uh, about half of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, N uh, 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 NLC 
uh, is asking, you know, they put their own proposal. So these are part of the proposal. But like I said, this is not a university-wide something, the technologies that say it, and, uh, you know, this is the process. Uh, I don't know whether we'll be able to meet the first uh, May deadline within which we'll come up with the, the agreed minimum wage. But to me, I think uh, minimum wage or living wage is not the main issue. The main issue is for the government to address the system, to create an enabling uh, environment which uh, people will uh, survive. Like as I am a worker, I, I depend solely on uh, salary. But to me, I'm, I'm against a minimum wage because one, I, we, the workers from uh, in Nigeria, constitute not more than 10% of uh, the population. What of the 90%? We go to the same market. And secondly, by the time you raise our basic uh, salary or whatever minimum wage, even if it is with one cobble, you know, the market people will sharpen their knife and raise uh this and so we'll go back a right race of uh, uh minimum wage inflation and so on so whatever is given uh will not even be uh, good enough to meet the standard so to me i think the best thing is for the government to see what plunge us into this issue of inflation address it and uh, even if the minimum wage is uh, 10,000 naira, if it is uh, enough for somebody to survive, we can do that one, rather than trying to po politicize uh, this issue. So I don't know. Uh, you know, there was a time even when NLC was asking about a million naira, and now the NLC and TUC now agreed, I think it's, uh, it is 635 or whatever, I've forgotten, that is 600 plus, and now NAT is asking of uh, 350. So all unions will come up with that, and uh, perhaps the government may eventually sit down and uh, if care is not taken they will just put it like uh, 40 or 50,000 and uh, up to now you know even the 30,000 most states cannot afford to pay so we'll be taking one step forward and uh, three steps backwards on this issue uh, maybe I'll have to try to become a politician and see how the reason and think uh, things through I don't know uh, one thing led to the hike in prices of almost everything and the living condition becoming worse and that is the fuel subsidy removal which has affected every aspect of our lives and then now the dollar is also uh, something to worry about even though we we saw some gains in the naira a few days ago it's now going back little by little we're hearing it is about 1,300 naira, which is still not good enough. People were asking us to clap for the government that uh, the naira is the best performing currency in the world. And I was just laughing and I, don't, I didn't know what to say uh, to that. And then now, it has given, these things have given rise to a situation where everybody will be asking for this much money. Now, will the money that they'll, they'll be paying um, workers now not be even more than the money they, they claimed to be losing uh, through fuel subsidy removal. I just don't know how the reason. But um, let's get, take another headline. The, the, the Dana Air skidded off the runway a few days ago and um, now they have been grounded. Experts are saying that they should not have been grounded. The way in as federal government grounds, uh, grounds um, Dana Air after runway accident. What do you think should have happened? They, they immediately, they just grounded Dana Air and said they can't fly anymore until checks are done and this and that. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's part of the practice all over the world where you have an uh, accident like this, you now ground them for a short while to, uh, to look at what is the cause and how you address it, not to uh, ground them permanently or for a long period, okay, that is one thing, but uh, it takes two to tango. Yes, there will be problem of uh, uh, the airline okay but also there is a problem of the authorities 
look at at uh, at our own airport i think what happened uh, was it not uh, uh rain that uh, make it to skid or whatever like that but um you see in other places you see the, no matter how terrible the condition is uh, planes can you know uh, take off and uh, land because there are equipments and gadgets but here we are just managing so many times you are, will be in the airport and as plane is about to land even in the night they will take off light so it will depend on you know the management and you know whatever uh, the, the the pilot to manage and see the uh, land so i think it there is uh, the government the authority should now make uh, the airlines to look at their own role in contributing to uh, such a risky uh, situation that we have in our airports. Okay. Um, now, uh, Zulum is asking, Governor Zulum of Borno State is asking uh, the military to establish base in Sambisa Forest. That's one of the uh, headlines uh, everywhere. So, what do you think? Sambisa Forest establish a military base there? Oh yes, this is a uh, part of the sol solution. Remember uh, the early years of uh, President Buhari when he commanded or directed uh, the army to move to Borno, and uh, also when the, the crisis in the Southern Kaduna uh, bases were military bases were created, and that helped to, you know calm uh, tension, uh, even though it didn't end it, but it had, uh, helped to calm uh, tension. And, uh, you know, Sambisa is becoming or has become a very uh, thorny issue in Nigeria. It's now over 10, almost 12 years when we have this process, and it is within Nigeria. So you now begin to doubt what happened with our military. If Sambisa, which is there, is not so sick, like uh, remember when we had the civil war, look at the area, but the military were able to go into that place. But here is Sambisa, which is not uh, that uh, as densely, as thickly as uh, the, the down south, the Hmong groups, but uh, the, the military are not able to do anything uh, tangible for over 10 years now. So I think it's, it is a good policy. Uh, if we can, uh, if the military can have a base there, so that uh, at least they will be able to arrest uh, uh, the situation. Uh, but I don't believe that uh, Sambisa is the only forest that bandits or the uh, Boko Haram insurgents are. Uh, these things are happening in Benue, in Zamfara, in uh, so many other places. They don't all carry their victims to Sambisa forest. So it means also that if they establish a, a, a military base in Sambisa, they might just move to another location. And they are not doing enough to make sure that they, they, they remove these people from any forest and employ other means. There are, there are drones everywhere that could be purchased to do this job. There are things that they could have done to make sure that uh, these people are no more where they are. So you move a military base to Sambisa Forest. Some of these military bases have been attacked even in the past uh, by these uh, insurgents and all that. So I don't see how that can be a solution. Anyway, you said one of no, the solutions. No, you, you, you said yeah, one I, of the I, solutions. I, I, I little bit agree to, with you to some extent, but you have to look at the, the, the thing. In, in so many places, uh, the, the usual practice before was where you have flash points, you have uh, military checkpoints, and they stay uh, for some time. Like here in Kano, if you are going down south, uh, to a southern Kano, uh, you are going to plateau. Uh, you know, we, we have bases there, and uh, in so many places where, you know, it started like a checkpoint and you established them. But these are flash points. The, the, where I agree with you is that, yes, there is need now uh, to minimize the manpower to increase the firepower of our military. And this is where you do now with drones and other things that uh, we do. But you, you, you must have also the manpower around so that if the drones are able to detect so that the military will go, Otherwise, you see, it would be a very costly thing 
how much do you think it costs for uh, a, a, a military uh, fighter jet to just uh, fly for about one hour? And, uh, you know, we have so many things. So at least uh, we should have a combination of uh, both the manpower and firepower and uh, the tech uh, to uh, combine it in such a way that we do it. And the other problem is um, like what is happening uh, now uh, here in the north, if uh, the military are able to flush out uh, uh, the bandits in Zampara, they move to neighboring state, they come to Kaduna, they go to Niger and so on. They, they don't do the tactics of, you know, condoning them, you know, blocking the uh, access uh, away out and now maybe dealing with them at that place. So they will leave one place open. I mean, they will attack one place and leave all the other rare ends uh, open. So that's why they keep on moving from one place to another. Okay, well, uh, this is uh, eventually where we have to draw the curtain on uh, uh, of the press this morning. We'd like to thank you, Professor Sanifage, for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Okay, we've been talking with Professor Sanifage uh, on uh, of the press. We were looking at some headlines, and uh, we saw headlines from the Guardian, the Daily Trust, the Punch newspaper, Vanguard, and all that. And some of the headlines we didn't touch are queues return as fuel scarcity hits Abuja, five states. Um, 35 oil firms face probe over environmental pollution, those are in punch. Consumers lament as food prices rise 30% in eight states. 500,000 households to get Lagos palliative, says Somolu, uh, and so many other headlines. And then reverse crisis, four UK loyalists resign as commissioners from Fubara's cabinet. Yesterday we heard about two, the Minister, uh, the Commissioner for Finance and Commissioner for Justice resigned when they were redeployed, uh, but two more uh, have been added to that fray now. Uh, we have uh, lead British school victims sue bullies, give ultimatum for sanction. Why power sector crisis won't end soon by electricity workers? That's on the vanguard. And there are so many other headlines. Please read up on some of these headlines and know what is happening in your country and see which problem you can solve as a person. Okay, we're going to take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs> 